Got it. All right, we're live. Uh, <clears throat> running out of time for, for our lectures. But we've got a lecture today. We're going to probably go through Monday. Our lecture exam is going to be next week, Thursday, Friday. We'll go live Thursday morning. Take it by the end of Friday. Uh, the practical, only up through the nematodes, no canthocephalins. No canthocephalins on the practical, no canthocephalins on the lecture exam. We'll get through, we'll get through these filarial worms, uh, and then we'll, we'll call it, we'll call it there. Uh, we'll still pick up the canthocephalins, we'll do that probably on Wednesday, but those won't be on the exam. All right, don't forget the quiz is posted. All right. Uh, might get a quiz up on on here. What I may do is kind of select which quizzes, you know, restrict the questions. So if we don't get through everything today, uh, just only have questions up through the, the parasites that we've covered. So that way, kind of gets you looking into that material, and then you just have one unknown, uh, hopefully one one parasite that, that we haven't covered. All right, parasites in the news. Not technically a parasite, but I saw this. And I laughed. Um, how appropriate. A full worm moon helped break the log jam in Stuhez Canal. Uh, nice worms. Not parasites. Down in the article they talk about why it's called the worm moon. Earthworm casts become visible on the ground. But we could imagine that they're talking about parasites. We can. It's, it's, I mean, it's like intestinal blockage for that ship, right? right? It's an asterisk there. I was going to say, so how exactly did the worm help break them? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's a coincidence, but I had to laugh. I had to laugh. All right. So we're here. I believe this is where we left off, right? Ancaster today, we introduced it and then we stopped, right? So. Again, these are uh, basically filarial worms, uh, families, of, let's see, we did this, right? And we talked about the symbiotic bacteria, right? right. It's only passed down from, from mother, mother to offspring, males, they don't transmit it, right? And they're important, you're gonna see why, why they're important. Um, we did talk, we did have this thought, right? Yeah, that one. Yes, all right. So what we're going to do is pick up with Wuchereri bancrofti. Right, this is a causative agent of elephantiasis. You've probably heard of it. Probably looked up elephantiasis. You've probably seen pictures and not realized that you were looking at elephantiasis. All right, it's a pretty gruesome, gruesome disease if, if in humans. Uh, and for this, I'll tell you that Wuchereri bancrofti isn't the only cause of elephantiasis. All right, it's not the only cause, but Wuchereri bancrofti can cause it. All right, and it's typically the, the one that causes this. All right, so for Wuchereri bancrofti, humans are the only known definitive host. No known reservoirs, that's it. It's humans and then mosquito. This parasite is distributed across the equatorial belt, right? primarily in, uh, primarily in, Africa, Middle East, Asia, Southern Asia. All right, this was bad on, on our troops in, in Vietnam, and really in Vietnam. Uh, we didn't have it here in the Americas, we do now, and thought that it was brought here as part of the slave trade. And in fact, Charleston, Charleston South Carolina was a hot spot of infection until about the 1920s. About that time, it's, it's suspected that that was a time of a harsh winter that that killed off a large number of mosquitoes, which basically took Wuchereria with it. Any few mosquitoes that still had it, it, there wasn't enough to transmit to humans. All right, mm -hmm. so let's go through the life cycles. Uh, I do have image diagram of our mosquitoes, so you can kind of see some of the structures that, that we'll talk about. All right. Enlarge this.
Brewery of Bancroft. All right, we are up. So our adult worm, our adult female, adult worms, are found in the afferent lymph channel. Afferent, afferent lymph channel in various lymph nodes. All right, so what is the afferent lymph channel? We also have efferent lymph channel. What's the <coughs> afferent lymph, lymph channel? Got it. <clears throat> so we had afferent and e for efferent, A versus E. What's the difference between them? So if you think about it, we've got a lymph node here, and we've got the duct this way, and if we've got blood or lymphatic fluid flowing that way, which one's the afferent, which one's the efferent? Fifty-fifty chance. Afferent and afferent duct. Yep. Yep. The afferent. This is the afferent. All right, so it is the channel that is going into the lymph node. Right? It's the channel that's going into the lymph node. These adults, the adult female, is going to release microfilaria. Microfilaria is plural. All right, they're released into the lymphatic system. And then these microfilaria will burrow out and get into the circulatory system. Where we will detect our microfilaria in the peripheral blood. So the blood of your basal extremities and so forth. That's skin capillaries. All right, so it's here allows the microfilaria to be ingested when a mosquito comes out and takes a blood meal. All right, so we're going to be in, in a mosquito, and I'll get I'll get the human versus. So we're up here for human. Here we are for the mosquito. All right, so. Our mosquito picks up the microfilaria. Microfilaria now is in the gut. Oops. But it doesn't stay there. So I better make sure I'm not running out of space. We're good. It's not going to stay there. It's actually going to migrate to the thoracic muscle. We're in the thoracic muscles. These are basically the flight muscles of our mosquito. So the microfilaria burrow out of the gut, go to the muscles, where they mature into the J1. All right? After about eight days, our J1 will molt to the J2 stage. That J2 stage is called a sausage one. because of its shape, all right? So it's microflaria is gonna be long and thin. This is gonna be short and stout type of worm, um, kind of sausage shaped, if you can think of that, all right? This worm has an anal plug, which if it has, if, it, if its anus is plugged, you would then assume that the worm is not eating, not feeding, because you can't get food through the rest of, of of the body. But these worms still continue to feed, and that's kind of a, a more recent development in, in identifying you know, what's going on. So they're still feeding, but they're only at the stage where 
about half the time, because then about two to four days later, our sausage worm will molt to our J3 stage. So two to four days later, it'll molt to the J3 stage. Now, this stage, we're slender, we're filariform. So go back to our introductory to nematode slide. We, we utilize uh, filariform as a description of, of a nematode. So they're going to be microfilaria, long and thin. They kind of mature to the J1, become the sausage worm as a J2, and then they kind of lengthen and slim up for the J3 to stop eating sausages. Right here, imagine that. Now, at the J3, we're still in the thoracic muscle. Our J3 now will migrate. in our mosquito, and they migrate to the mouth parts. The specific area is the labium, which is basically the proboscis sheath. So the proboscis, the proboscis is made up of several parts of the mouth part to make it look like it's, it's a needle, all right? And this mosquito has had the sheath around it, so it's gonna migrate to the labium, to that, that area there, so that when the mosquito feeds, it can now deliver our J3 right into the blood of the host. Right to the blood of the host. It takes a, it's about 10 to 12 days post-infection. From when the mosquito initially feeds to when it when it's infected and can transmit this J3. Two weeks, week and a half to two weeks. Now, once we get into the blood, we still need to get to the afferent lymph channel and our migration. Actually, pretty easy. It goes right there. It goes right there to the apparent channel. And it'll go to the numerous ones. Um, oftentimes it would be like the, the lumbar growing leg region where it might, might go. All right, but then once we get here, bolts to the J4, bolts to the adult stage where it will now mate and start releasing our microfilaria. Now, this whole thing doesn't. They get here pretty quickly, but the development and the development to the point where we're releasing microfilaria is about six to 12 months. It's about how long it takes to start releasing the microfilaria. Now, what do we know about this life cycle? What are the adaptations? Now, there's a pretty big one here. We're going to see it again uh, with some of our protozoan parasites. But our microfilaria, circulation in the peripheral blood is periodic. Right? It's not, you can't just go out to an individual detect microfilaria at any time of the day. The highest microfilaria or micro, microfilaremia, the highest number of microfilaria are observed between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 p.m. Two p.m. to ten. Ten p.m. to two a.m. I think I said ten p.m. to two p.m. Ten p.m. to two a.m. The midnight hours. Why? Well, and that's that's instead of asking why. What's the benefit for the parasite? Maybe. Not like your body slowing down, maybe it's gonna be easier to get. I'm trying, I was just taking a guess. Anybody else? You're more likely to get sick on this because you're not gonna, well, you're not gonna swat it. We hear you sleep, so you're not gonna kill the mosquitoes. Yeah, so this, we're at the time period where our, our bodies are typically asleep. 
we're going to be less likely to swat up mosquitoes, which means mosquitoes can come in and have a blood meal on, on us quite readily. Now, that's kind of the benefit. Right? That increases the transmission, makes it more likely that mosquitoes you know, microfilaria is in the blood at the time when the mosquitoes are feeding. So, you know, synch synchronized uh, transmission or time of transmission. What's the cause of it? Well, good question. Oxygen tension seems to be at least one of the triggers. Is as you sleep, oxygen tension goes down. All right, body becomes we are, our breathing goes down. All right, we are resting. So oxygen concentration in our blood goes down. That that seems to be a trigger to at least increase microfluidic uh, production. But body temperature could also do this because again, when you when you go to sleep, you know your body temperature temp typically drops uh, at night. So I'm I'm going to put both of these as question marks. Uh, oxygen temperature or oxygen tension seems to be. One of the primary players. Now, is it is it more of a correlation and not a causation? That's where that question mark comes in. Is it just correlated because these two happen when we're asleep, or is this actually a cause? When we go to sleep, that's our trigger. That's a sign that says, "Hey, microfilaria, get out to the peripheral blood." Questions here? Any questions on the live side? All right, so our diagram of the mosquito kind of tells you where these guys go. So your proboscis, you can make out proboscis actually has several structures leading to a stylet. There's a sheath that actually surrounds it. So when the mosquito bites, it actually kind of retracts. Uh, these are, I think they are mandibles. Modified mandibles. Who's had who's an invert? We didn't talk there was a mosquito. But it, oh yeah, okay. Entomology? Maybe. The I believe that the modified mandibles uh, are these styles. But that's where they go. So then when they when they you know if they're up in this region and they bite, now you're uh, J3s can just kind of follow along. Sometimes they get deposited uh, on the surface and then they penetrate right into the wound. All right, so it's not like in the salivary glands where it then gets delivered into the host. They're at the mouth parts, they're going to get transferred, they might be stuck on, on the proboscis, and then when it gets injected, uh, when it gets injected, it's now in the, in the body. Now, we said it takes six to, tw six to 12 months for our microfilaria to appear. These females are going to be releasing microfilaria for five to ten years. A long time. So we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to deal with that. We deal with it because of the pathology that it causes. Now, there are several names for the disease. The general term is lymphatic filariasis, which is infection of the lymphatic system by filarial worms. But Wuchereria is not the only filarial worm that's out there. There's some other filarial worms that can also be infected. However, 90% of all of the, the lymphatic filariasis is caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. And for that reason, then, instead of just saying lymphatic filariasis, people have said, well, this is bancroftian filariasis, because it's the filariasis caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. Or in, in the Monsters Inside Me episode, which is no longer, I don't think it's available on YouTube anymore for free. You have to pay for it. When they talk about, about this, it's, it's not Wukereri Bancrofty, it's W Bancrofty. <laughs> Hunting voice, it's like W. They couldn't even use the full name. All right, so Bancrofty and Filariasis. The other one is Elephantiasis. And again, Wukereri is not the only cause of elephantiasis, but it is probably the most common cause of it. 
So what is elephantiasis? It's a buildup of lymphatic fluid leading to the thickening of the skin. It gives the impression uh, that the skin is like elephant-like skin. Thick, rough, you might call it dry, but I, think, I, I don't know, I've never like put my hand on an elephant and been that bold. And that's kind of strange because all of our other terms, all of our other diseases and stuff, you know, when you see this iasis, you know, it's like caused by something. Onchocerciasis, which we'll talk about, dirofiliasis, uh, all right? This isn't caused by elephants, <laughs> right? So it is kind of strange, but regardless, lymphatic filariasis, elephantiasis. Now, with this parasite, because it lives so long and because of, of the damage that is done to produce these symptoms, we go through three phases, an asymptomatic phase, an inflammatory or an acute phase, and then an obstructive phase. The one that we mostly see is going to be the inflammatory, the obstructive phase. Right, a lot of people don't talk about the asymptomatic phase. So, you ready? People shook their head yes. All right, asymptomatic phase. <clears throat> During this phase, individuals usually have high microfilaremias. They have a high number of microfilaria circulating in their peripheral blood. Again, it's going to be in that periodic fashion. During this phase, the Th1 inflammatory response is suppressed, so you don't see a whole lot of inflammation at all, if at, if at any. All right, Th2 response is stimulated. Reason for this is, is probably unclear, but you keep the inflammatory response down, and it seems like the microfilaria are able to persist under these conditions. Now, is this the parasite that's causing it? Possibly. It's possibly a form of immune modulation. Now, this type of condition, this asymptomatic phase, could persist for several years before we start seeing inflammatory reactions. Now, the reason for all of this might be the actual worm antigens and maybe tied to uh, the exposure as a fetus. So what typically happens is, you know, if a mother is infected, a pregnant mother gets infected with Wuppereria, some of those antigens cross the placental barrier, get into the fetus. The fetus immune system recognizes the worm antigen, and because they recognize the worm antigen, they don't respond to the microfilaria. So these newborns, you know, young toddlers, right, they, they don't react against that, the microfilaria, which, again, in terms of the life cycle of Wuppereria, that's a good thing because it increases the chances that the microfilaria could be, uh, can persist in the peripheral blood and can be picked up by our mosquitoes. We do have something called endemic normals. All right, so these are individuals that live in uh, susceptible areas. They live in the area where Wuppereria is circulating, is infecting people. These individuals, they exhibit no symptoms whatsoever, yet the worm antigen is detected in the blood so that they are infected. All right, they have the, the adult worms. The catch with that is that those individuals you don't detect the microfilaria in them. So it's almost like they have the adult, the adult's reproducing, but the body is taking out the microfilaria. So almost like a, you know, a tolerance level. We're going to tolerate the adult worm, but our body takes out those microfilaria. Now what's interesting with these endemic normals is even though they're asymptomatic and not showing any signs, they're not showing any microfilaria. You, some of them will develop the inflammatory restructure reactions and obstructive symptoms later in life. And as you'll see, it's these symptoms, the inflammatory reactions, obstructive symptoms, I should say at least the obstructive symptoms, that may be tied to the microfilaria itself. So even though you're not detecting them, they must still be there, albeit at low levels. Now, if any one of us go out to these areas where we can get Wuppereria, 
it's unlikely that we would exhibit this asymptomatic phase. We're not used to these antigens, our body hasn't seen them, so when we do see it, our body reacts and will wipe up and, and will generate the inflammatory response. Will it wipe out the worm? No, the, again, these parasites are very effective at evading host immune system. In terms of the nematodes, that cuticle is, is very resistant. All right, we good with the asymptomatic phase? The inflammatory or the acute phase is that second stage. At this point, we've been infected. The adult worms have been shedding the microfilaria for a while. Now, this, as the name implies, we're going to start exhibiting inflammation, right? And it's primarily attributed to the antigens of the adult worm, specifically the adult females. So little, if any, is, is of damage or disease is caused by the microfilaria itself. It's the antigen. Now, this is some of the antigens of the adult worms. We also have inflammation that's due to invasion of bacteria from our skin. So our skin actually has bacteria on it. And it's thought that when we go through these periodic inflammatory episodes, kind of characterized by, the, by some of these symptoms, by the fevers and the chills and so forth, you can now detect the skin bacteria in the lymphatic fluid. Something is happening. What? Good question. They think that this type of inflammation isn't just the adult worms, but it's also the Wolbachia antigens, that symbiotic bacteria that's living inside the adult worms uh, that our body starts to react to when the worm dies uh, or degenerates, or possibly even through secretory, excretory products of that worm. So, you know, worm antigens causing some inflammation, then you've got this secondary bacteria, the symbiotic bacteria that's ramping up the, the immune response but it's not continuous. It's going to be periodic. Sometimes you go through these phases, sometimes you don't. Characteristics of this is, is we start to see lymphedema, which is obstruction of lymphatic ducts leading to a buildup of lymphatic fluid. But this tends to just be temporary. So you'll get some swelling. Right? And the reason you get this is from inflammation of the lymph nodes in the channels, all right? because that's where the worm has died. That's where this Wolbachia or Wolbachia antigen is, is becoming apparent. So the symptoms of this include the chills and the fevers, all right? classic you know, inflammatory responses, a swollen, warm, and tender skin of the uh, lymph, lymphedematitis, lymphedematitis, lymphedematitis. Uh, extremity. So whichever lymph node gets inflamed, you start to get some swelling. It's going to feel warm. It's going to feel tender, uh, as well as superficial lymphatic vessels uh, un under the skin can, be, can feel tender. You can kind of get that, you know, occasionally when we get a, a bad sickness, you know, sometimes the lymph nodes uh, of, of the neck get swollen, and those are kind of sensitive to the touch. Same type of thing. And it could be so inflamed that it's actually painful to touch. Now again, it's periodic inflammation, so this isn't just running through for months on end. You'll get it, it it'll ramp up, and then it'll go away after a couple weeks, maybe, maybe after a month or so. This is kind of showing, this image uh, from a paper, and, and I've got the DOI up there. It's tiny on this. Uh, maybe you can make it out, but this kind of shows you the lymphatic system. So this is a normal, all right? They add tracers to kind of look at the lymph nodes and the lymphatic vessels, and this is what a normal individual will look like. An individual in this acute phase is starting to have damage done to their lymphatic system, leading to a backup of lymph lymphatic fluid. So now you start actually seeing the ducts themselves, and, and oftentimes it's in the legs it is where you tend to catch it, legs in the, in the lower, uh, the lumbar region. A feature of this type of phase, um, present in males, is hydrocele. So what you start getting is the forcing of lymphatic fluid in the tunica vaginalis of the testes or spermatic cord. In layman's terms, the testes swell and they become painful. Abnormal size, but that's not the elephantiasis yet. 
and no, I didn't, I didn't put some of these terms in bold. I'm not going to ask you what's hydrohydrosyl or whatever. All right. So as we talked about bacterial, normally found in skin, can be cultured from the lymphatic and circulatory system. This probably contributes to, to the inflammation as well. All right. During this inflammatory symptoms, these are the things that we are likely to see. All right. Orchitis, epidemitis, 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 hydrocele, all right, all of those things, basically inflammation of the testes. That's why in, in males, that's what you'll get. It will be large, the testes will swell and they will become painful. We also see proliferation of the cells lining the lymphatic system. And remember, that last phase is, is obstructive phase. So you can start seeing with the inflammation that's happening in these, these nodules, in the lymphatic system, it's stimulating proliferation of the cells, getting to the point where now all of this proliferation could start to cause blockage. All right? Now, during these inflammatory episodes, the microfilaria are often gone. You don't detect them anymore, which kind of lends credence to the idea that, that the inflammatory response, the Th1 resp response, can wipe out the microfilaria. Th2 response does not. The other part of that is perhaps blockage of those lymphatic vessels keep the microfilaria from ever getting into the circulatory system. So two possibilities. And again, I didn't, I think inflammation of the testes is probably sufficient because that is a common situation. Ready? Aren't you glad I didn't put pictures up here? I'll let you Google it. Ready? All right. We're getting that inflammation, we're getting the buildup, the thickening of the lymphatic ducts, ultimately leading to blockage. And this is what we typically associate, I mean, with your Wuchereri bankruptcy. All right? So it's symptoms, so those related to blockage. So probably the earliest symptoms would be lymph varices. So you've probably heard of varicose veins Right, this is lymph lymphatic vessels that are varicose. Uh, they're going to be enlarged. They're going to take on a gnarled appearance, all right, and they're going to start to be visible through the skin. Right, the reason is blockage. The lymphatic vessels can't drain, so you get the backup, and it causes those vessels to enlarge and stretch. All right. So as you block it and you can't drain it, that lymph is going to have to go someplace. So it infiltrates tissue. Blood's going to pick it up uh, to the point where we now can start exhibiting lymph fluid in the urine. It's called chyluria. The urine's going to take on a milky color. It's due to the lymph and emulsified fats that kind of come along with it. Sometimes you'll see blood in the urine at this point. All right, so the lymphatic fluid's going to have to go someplace. In extreme cases, that lymphatic vessel will, or the lymphatic fluid will find its way into the sweat glands to where you're actually sweating this lymphatic fluid. That's kind of what the monsters inside me was talking about. Individual, you know, went, he served in Vietnam, came back, no symptoms until 15, 20 years later, and started having this, this huge swelling. Mm -hmm. Started with the testes, then it moved to his legs, and, you know, doctors and nurses at the VA just kept saying, you're going to have to deal with it, you're going to have to deal with it. They deal with what? We don't even know what's going on. Uh, yet his leg was sweating out lymphatic fluid. All right, and then this this extreme case is elephantiasis, and that's what I have. So the images here, that's your your lymph varices. This is elephantiasis, massively enlarged limb. All right, the organ mo mostly becomes composed of fibrous connective tissue, granulomatous tissue, and fat. All right, so again, you're causing stretching. 
Uh, you're causing damage to the body's responding to try to repair that, all right? Excess uh, connective tissues get added. And then, you know, the skin is stretching. Skin is stretching up to the point where now it's going to start becoming thickened. And in many cases, it starts to become cracked. Right? Hence, like skin of an elephant. In males, the most likely places that where you see this elephantizes these enlarged organs is number one, the scrotum, then the legs and the arms. All right, so yeah, just you can do a Google search of elephantiasis, you're gonna see a lot of those enlarged scrotums. All right. In the women, it's typically the legs and the arms, and then more rarely, it's going to develop in the vulva and the breasts. So again, if you do a search for elephantiasis, you will find some images of one of the one breast that's, that's enlarged from this lymphedema. And usually it's it's not just that's not the only symptom. You'll see evidence in the legs uh, of this elephantiasis developing. Questions? That wasn't too bad. There's a lot of pictures out there. All right. All right, next parasite, Oncocircal volvulus. Another filaria. This is also distributed along the equatorial belt in Africa, South and Central America. Again, this was likely introduced in the Americas during the slave trade. Oncocircal volvulus is the causative agent of non-fatal diseases. All right, so you're not, this isn't likely to kill. All right, the non-fatal diseases, onchocerciasis, is your generic term. River blindness is a more specific term, which is blindness. Got its name, river blindness, because of the association with, with, of this life cycle with, uh, with water. So it seemed like when people that travel, the people that lived near a water source were more likely to get this and then develop the blindness. Some of the star, stark images are these, where you see older individuals consider the elders of the tribe being led around by the younger individuals. And you can almost think ahead 20, 30 years that the roles now is going to be reversed. This youngster now, as he becomes an elder of the tribe, is now going to have to be led around uh, the village because they're blinded by the parasite. All right, so life cycle. Get this done. This is great. So we've all, we have a slide uh, in our lab that depicts the onchocercoma. So that onchocercoma is the subcutaneous tissue, subcutaneous cyst, where we find our worms. This. It's one, one last thing with uh, your Ruccarari Bancrofti. Typically, you don't start getting those uh, inflammatory responses for several years after you've had the adult worm and it's been shedding the microfilaria. The obstructive phase doesn't normally develop five to 10 years. Some cases it doesn't develop in 15 or 20 when the worm's long gone. That's part of the problem with that Vietnam vet is that you do your blood draws, you're not detecting anything, you don't expect it. He probably got infected when he was in Vietnam, and that was 30 years ago. It was, 30, I think, 30 years ago. All right, so Anca Circle Volvulus, our adults are going to be found in our subcutaneous connective tissue.
subcutaneous connective tissue where our host immune system will basically try to encapsulate them. leading to that formation of the oncocircle. The subcutaneous connective tissue is the site of our infection. They're going to exist as pairs or groups of worms in this uh, oncocircoma, where our adults are going to release the microfilaria. Now, the microfilaria are not going to enter the circulatory system. Instead, they are going to remain in the fluid of the skin. And there's a reason, because the fluid of the skin is closer to the surface than the blood capillaries. And that's an important distinction because our intermediate host is not a mosquito. It is actually a black fly. So a black fly is going to come along and bite the human where it feeds on the tissue fluid. Its mouth parts aren't very long, so it can't reach the capillaries, but it can cut and feed on, on the fluids. That's why when it's going to pick up our microfilaria. So we will have our microfilaria in the gut. Human. Not all black flies will serve as a host. Uh, it's the genus. Simulium are the ones that serve as a host. So, so if you're sitting outside enjoying the weather this weekend, don't look at a fly, a house fly, and say, that guy's got Anka Circa. Wrong genes. Wrong gene. But microflaria is in the gut. Microflaria is going to migrate. And develop then into a J1, molt to the J2, molt to the J3. Now, where do they migrate? Same place as Wooper area in the thoracic muscles. Right, so, flight muscles of our black fly. And same type of thing, J2 is going to be that sausage worm. Our J3 is going to be slender and filariform. All right, once we get to the J3 stage, now we will migrate, get to the mouth parts, or the labium. And we can't really use the proboscis sheath because it's not a mosquito, but it gets to the labium. Same type of structure, all right? Where our black fly can then, as it feeds, deposit our J3s into the wound or on the surface, which then find their way in via the wound, putting it back into our tissue fluid. Feeding. There's a break, human and black flies. J3 is going to remain in that subcutaneous tissue fluid where it'll molt to a J4, molt to our adult. All right, so we said mouth parts can, oh, hold on, our adults. Adults can live up to 16 years. They can be long lived. And in that time, they're going to release some of these microfilaria. And some of those microfilaria, instead of staying in the tissue, skin tissue fluid, some of them will enter the circulatory system and migrate throughout the body and get lost. When this happens, we can get some significant pathology. 
So we'll kind of talk about that, about the pathology. We already mentioned the, the mouth parts quietly. Microflare, you have to stay in that skin tissue fluid in order to be picked up. Any questions? So our onchocerchoma is going to have pairs or group of worms in there. Uh, they're going to be releasing their microfilaria. Microfilaria should stay in the skin tissue fluid in order to be picked up. But some of them will get, will find their way into the circulatory system and travel throughout the body. Now, these onchocerchomas vary by region. All right, And this may actually be like a subspecies. Or, uh, hey, I hate to use subspecies, hate to use kind of race, but say populations, genetically distinct populations. So, ecotypes. Ecotypes. Great, you remembered it. It could be two different ecotypes, and it could be related to introduction. So, two different introductions into the Americas. Because African and Venezuelan strains, which tend are genetically indistinct from each other, most of the onchocercomas are found below the waist. The other ecotype, Central and South American ones, most of the rest of the Central and South American ones, those onchocercomas tend to appear above the waist, with a lot of them appearing in the head and neck region. All right, so there, is, there seems to be something there, genetically distinct ecotypes maybe, all right, but they are not genetically distinct enough to separate them into species, and I don't even think they're distinct enough to separate them into subspecies. All right. Uh, in this parasite, humans are the only known host. Again, all right, it's humans and black flies. That's it. Now, the pathology is caused by the different stages. So the adults are going to cause one type of pathology. The microfilaria are going to cause another type of pathology. It's kind of a distinction between uh, Oncocerca and Wuchereria, where Wuchereria is almost entirely due to adults and dying adults and, and so forth. All right? So for the adults in this, they're forming that, that onchocercoma, and the onchocercoma is going to cause changes in the skin. Now, the presence of the onchocercomas are going to be much more pronounced when located over bones, right? because they'll protrude a lot more. They, they won't kind of recess back into muscle. All right? But overall, they cause limited harm to the host. The negative aspect of it is that these onchocercomas can cause a buildup of uh, connective tissue, granulomatous tissue, leading to a loss of elasticity of the skin itself. And if you lose the elasticity of the skin, then you can develop, you know, basically a hanging skin type of pattern or hanging skin type of, of pathology. Well, the one that, that's here is called hanging groin, which is sagging of the groin into these pendulous sacs. And again, it's, it's all due to you know, loss of elasticity, ultimately. Uh, oftentimes, these sacs will contain lymph nodes. But unlike uh, Wuchereria, we don't see any sort of inflammation uh, in the testes like we do with Wuchereria. I mean, so you could get some of this, this hanging groan from Wuchereria. But if you get that, you typically also have some of the other inflammatory symptoms. Not so much with Oncocerco boldness. All right, that's the adults. So what we'll do on Monday is talk about the microfilaria pathology, and then we'll, we'll finish out Oncocerco, talk about river, blind, river blindness, and finish out with heartworm. I think that's all we have left. Yeah, that's all we have left is heartworm. All right, so don't forget, we've got the live quiz. Those of you, I haven't, I haven't checked recently, but if you haven't completed any of the other quizzes, remember, all of those I will just go through and assign a grade. Uh, I will assign a grade starting on, I think, Tuesday at some, at some time. So you, you lose the ability to take those late, so that way the rest of the class has the opportunity to download and look at the keys. All right? Just don't forget to check out all of those. All right, I'll see some of you on Wednesday. It is Wednesday. I'll see some of you later today.